Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Elton, and I'm going to be talking about why self-explanation and applicability domain analysis are key to building more robust and trustworthy AI systems. Uh, so I have a brief disclaimer. I'm speaking here in my personal capacity. The opinions expressed here are my own and do not reflect the view of the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the United States government. Uh, so when people talk about explanation, they have many different things that they mean and many different motivations for doing it. Um, I find it useful to make uh, a distinction between uh, two different types, uh, conventional explanations and mechanistic explanations. So I'm gonna move very quickly here. Um, conventional explanations are just trying to approximate the input output mappings of the model. And they usually are verbal descriptions which are tailored to be relevant to the end user. So whatever uh, certain domain of, of expertise the end user is in, the descriptions are couched in the terminology of that domain. Um, this is very different than the type of explanation which would be more like a scientific explanation which I call a mechanistic explanation. And this type of explanation is an approximation as well, but actually faithful to the underlying mechanism by which the model is functioning. Um, and this is very important because you can have two models that have very similar input output mappings or even identical input output mappings on a certain data set, but work very differently under the hood. And to build you know, trustworthy, robust AI, we'd really like to know like, how are these things functioning under the hood and, and you know, are, will they continue to function it well in the field? Um, and then finally, another thing I discuss in my paper is meta-level explanation, which is sort of like an evolutionary explanation. So instead of, optim um, instead of a, a, uh, you know, an organism optimizing its evolutionary fitness, you have these models that are optimizing their loss function. So you describe the loss function and the training procedure to explain uh, how the model was, was created and how it, how it should work. Um, I think mechanistic explanation is the most important part, uh, type of explanation we could try to, try to get. And uh, it's important because it's the only type of explanation that can tell you if the model is going to function when it's asked to extrapolate. Um, and as we know right now, deep learning is really not robust to small distributional shifts. So for instance, DeepMind uh, had a, a very impressive system for playing Atari games, but it was discovered that if you move the paddle just a little bit higher in the game of breakout, that system completely breaks. And this is really a universal phenomenon right now where these systems are extremely brittle and um, prone to error if, if the uh, uh, data it's being run on is, is different than what it was trained on. Um, here's an example from some of my very recent work where we're trying to use a deep neural net to segment the pancreas. And we'd really like to know like how is it doing the segmentation is it looking at the liver? Is it looking at the stomach? How is it locating the pancreas? Um, and if it's just putting like the segmentation in the middle of the image, um, that's not a very robust method. Um, so there's many, many different explainability techniques that have been developed. Um, I haven't gotten to read all these papers, but I've certainly looked at them and I've read a number of them. And um, there's actually been very little work studying if these are actually useful. Um, so there's really only one paper I've seen where they study if any of these methods actually help people predict the uh, behavior of, of uh, a black box model. And um, so far it looks like none of these really help that much. Of course, you can invent very nice stories and such based on these, which maybe will convince your customer um, that you understand what's going on. But from a scientific perspective, uh, I don't think any of these are really very useful or have been shown to be useful. Um, 
And there's many pitfalls with these. I think the saliency maps, which are uh, unfortunately one of the most popular, um, have some of the, the, the most pitfalls. So th there's a great paper called Sanity Checks for Saliency Maps, where they do a number of, uh, of uh, experiments. And one of the things they do is they try randomizing different layers in the neural net. And they find that uh, as you randomize more and more layers, the output of a lot of these um, saliency visualizations uh, don't really change. And so here they've, uh, they're out uh, randomizing from the deeper layers to the uh, more shallow layers in the, in the neural net. And so it, what it looks like a lot of these methods are doing is they're just showing you what's going on in like the first layer or first and second layers, which is basically just edge detection. Um, so that's not really that useful. Uh, this is another example from Cynthia Rudin, where she's she shows this um, saliency map for uh, quote explaining why a deep neural network uh, classified this picture as a Siberian husky, and uh, but then she goes and looks at the output for a transverse flute classification, and this is the visualization for. Uh, you know, that output and why, why it, would, it would think this image is a transverse flute. And as you can see, these, these two visualizations look very similar. So just on the basis of these, we can't really tell why the, the network classified this as a Siberian Husky rather than a transverse flute. Of course, it does show you kind of where it's looking, but it doesn't explain what the network's actually doing. And then there's some other problems like sensitivity to hyperparameters and uh, also uh, adversarial attacks can be performed showing a, a lack of robustness for these explainability uh, visualizations. Um, so I'd, recently, uh, the past year or two, uh, there's, there's been this discovery of the double descent phenomena. And I think this is very important for understanding why deep, how deep neural networks function and why they are hard to interpret. And it's been known for quite a while that deep neural nets um, often have a hundred times more parameters than training points. So from a classical statistics perspective, they should be overfitting, uh, yet they do not overfit and they can still quote generalize, meaning they can uh, make accurate predictions on data points from the same distribution they were trained on. Um, and so the phenomenon of, of double descent um, and the related phenomenon of direct fitting, I think really explain uh, what's going on here. And so here we are, here we are looking at uh, the uh, test error for a image classifier as you increase the number of training points, uh, training parameters um, in the model. And so initially you see the error goes down, but then it uh, bottoms out and it starts to go up. So that is due to the uh, overfitting or uh, variance. And that is what you expect from the bias variance trade-off. Uh, however, at some point, as you add more and more parameters, this curve actually turns around and then the test error starts to go down again. And then when you're out in this very highly parameterized regime, you can just keep adding more and more parameters and this test error will keep going down and down and down. It does plateau at some point, but it doesn't actually go back up. So, um, this is uh, basically a complete breakdown of the bias variance trade-off, and this is what's known as double descent. Um, so uh, one reason this took a long time to be recognized is it's hidden by early stopping. Um, and uh, then there's some other references here I give for, for papers that discovered it a while ago, but again, it wasn't really recognized until uh, a year or two ago. Um, this is showing uh, this idea of direct fitting. Uh, and this is a, a figure from 
a paper by Hassan et al, which was published in the journal Neuron. And so if you're trying to fit this uh, parabolic function with noise and you add uh, a lot of parameters into your model, you're gonna get this uh, overfitting, which is characterized by uh, overshoot and undershoot. However, if you keep adding more parameters, you, run, you eventually get into this uh, regime where it's doing essentially an interpolation of the data points, and they call this the direct fit. Uh, if we look at this direct fitting, um, we can notice that it's, it's kind of a lot like uh, K nearest neighbors. Um, this kind of linear interpolation can be computed just locally based on nearby training data points. So it's not really looking at the global picture of what's going on or trying to extract global trends. It's really just doing a brute force kind of dumb uh, interpolation. Um, there is, you know, there is data compression and such, but it's, it's really this local um, brute force kind of interpolation. And so I argue in my paper, this, this explains why deep neural nets are so hard to understand. Um, another, another point is just that if the world is very complicated, uh, these deep neural nets are gonna be complicated. And I think they're just gonna keep getting more complicated and hard to understand as time goes on. So um, one of the things I look at is uh, self-explaining AI. Um, so this is an example where some people were doing um, diagnosis of lung nodules in CT with a deep neural net. And they attach this other output, which is predicting these attributes. And so they claim that the, these attribute predictions explain the diagnosis prediction. Um, I don't think that's true at all. And um, it's very possible that, or I should say, I don't think you can claim that because it's very possible that the network is doing these predictions completely independently um, under the hood. So um, in my paper, I look at using this uh, mutual information measure to calculate a relatedness score between the, uh, say the diagnosis output and the um, self-explanation output. Um, and this, this, this could help solve that, that problem and show that the output of the explanation branch is actually related to the output of the prediction branch. Um, and uh, there's a couple other things I think should be very, very standard um, to help build more trustworthy AI. One of them is uncertainty quantification. Um, so in science, uh, we can't really get away with uh, having a, a number without an uncertainty or error bar, but somehow in deep learning, we think it's okay. Um, uh, however, uh, uncertainty still has this problem where it breaks down if you're going outside the training data distribution. Um, but within the distribution, it can give you some, you know, additional information that can tell you whether how the system is working and whether it's we can trust the outputs and to what degree we can we can trust them. Um, to really address the problem of these networks breaking down when uh, due to distributional shift, we need to do this applicability domain analysis. Um, this is also called out of distribution detection. Uh, so a very simple way of doing this is just you delineate the training data uh, points. And then if you have a test data point that's outside that distribution, you send a, a warning to the user. Um, so this is also known as change point detection or detecting anonymous inputs. Um, and there's, there's quite a large literature on this, but it hasn't really been used very much. Um, uh, this is an approach I'm looking at right now for, for doing this with a variational autoencoder um, for uh, pancreas segmentation. So if you're interested in this, um, let me know and I'll send you the, uh, the, the paper that I'm putting together on this. Um, so in conclusion, um, a lot of explainability techniques right now are, can be very misleading. There's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of uh, people telling stories. They're just so stories about the visualizations and it's not very scientific. Um, double descent is, is, is suggests that this is gonna be a very hard thing to do. Um, 
because it's really going, you have to go back to the training data and look at what the training data is and how it's doing that interpolation. Um, I think a better, uh, perhaps a, a more practical uh, approach is to, to engendering a trust in these systems is um, a combination of these three things, which is the uncertainty quantification, out of distribution detection, and the self-explanation. And I encourage you to please cite my work and uh, check out my um, expanded manuscripts. Uh, thank you.